before I start, I realised from speaking to some of you earlier on that not everybody has heard of the Higher Education Academy. We are the national body in the UK for learning and teaching in higher education. And um, we do a lot of work both in institutions and internationally on learning and teaching and supporting and learning and teaching. And we do that through thematic areas such as internationalization. And I'm sure there's a number of you in the room who have been closely involved with some of these themes on employability, on retention and success. So there's, there's a lot of stuff on our website and I hope to have time to come to that at the end of the, the presentation. We also work um, with the disciplines and again on our website, which I know isn't always the easiest to access, but um, I've been told has been we're in the middle of, of rejigging it, would that be the right term for the right technical term for it? Um, so that again, there, is resor there are resources to access that, that, that sort of um, help with that. But today, um, I'm going to be talking, my report, uh, this is based on a report that uh, was commissioned by the HEA that was published by Joan Mulmahoney in April last year and it's looking at specifically the, the, the learning and teaching aspects of TNE and, and kind of opening up a lot of questions a bit like um, I was at a, an excellent workshop this morning with David where we're looking very much at what are the implications of TNE on teaching and learning and there's a lot of kind of complicated tricky stuff that I think emerges there and um, and that's what your bit of paper is for. So this first, I'm a humanities person, so graphs and tables are not my natural home. But this, um, I don't know if you can read the writing, basically the large purple section shows you um, the TNE arrangements that currently happen in the UK. And you can see that majority of institutions have some form of TNE and the majority is out with the Europe. So that's what that large purple section is and that the type of the delivery is majority in partner arrangements. So again, that's what that, that little graph tells you. Now, I know, I don't, I don't know how many of you have heard the term flying faculty um, as a term that's used to describe staff who are going um, to overseas campuses. But uh, what I'd like you to do with your little bit of paper, because I'm conscious that all of you have stories to tell of some kind of international, transnational education experience. And I'd like you to, um, if you can, make your bit of paper into a plane. <laughs> Write a little story on it, just a, of an experience that you've had, and it can be positive, it can be a challenge. Um, I know I've experienced it as a student, as a member of staff trying to set up partnership arrangements. There are brilliant stories, there are minds of stories. Uh, and post it to someone in the room that you don't know. Tell a little story that you can fly across the room. <laughs> the one I've got here talks about communication problems and and, and that reminds me of the time when I was in France and I was being inspected by an educationalist and he said to me that the way I spoke English was shocking and wrong because of the way I rolled my R's with my Scottish accent. So I think it's just an example and the communication is key and we were talking about that in the workshop this morning. An example of the sort of, the, the, the many layers, linguistic, cultural and all sorts that are happening all the time. And I think that's an area that makes, it's what makes the area so exciting, but it's what makes it challenging as well. So um, keep hold of your planes and we should have time to come back at the end of it. It might be useful for your research. Um, another little story there. In um, O'Mahony's report, these are some of the many, many definitions that people gave for what TNE is. And you can see there it counts as a lot of different examples, including don't have one. Um, a collaborative partner, which is interesting because I wonder what an uncollaborative partner would be. Um, or is, and, and again, we've been, that's, we've talked about that a little bit today. Um, off campus, supported delivery, PhD without residence. Imagine this sort of floating, floating PhD. But you can see there's a lot of definitions and I'm sure you'll have your very own definition. And again, I think it's what makes this one of the most challenging areas, along with internationalization and higher education, is that everyone has their own definition. Students, staff, different countries. And, and that's what makes it complicated, like we were seeing this morning. So this report doesn't, 
it, it, it's kind of, um, there's a lot of research and there's a very good literature review in this report actually of the research and learning and teaching that's been done in um, t and &E so far, but it points to the fact that we're, we're just at the start of this and we need to do a lot more research because we need to find out what's happening in learning and teaching. But I'll draw your attention um, first of all to our internationalization framework. I know some of you will know this very, very well. Um, it's a framework that, that looks again at supporting, um, supporting students in higher education and although I would argue because I suppose my background is post-colonial, that there is a very westernised focus. The idea is that it's, it's looking at how can we prepare graduates to live in and contribute responsibly to a global world. And I really like the idea that it's living as well and contributing. So it's not just about, um, it's not just about becoming graduates with skills and knowledge that they can take out. It's, it's the world that they have to live in and that we all have to live in. And um, the sort of intercultural aspect of it to me is, is absolutely central. And this idea, and this is sort of one of the slightly controversial uh, messages of the framework, is that we are all international, whether we like it or not and whether we know it or not, because no matter where we are in the UK or elsewhere, no matter which campus, whether we're off campus or in another country or whatever, we're having intercultural encounters all the time and that actually how, how do we deal with them and how do we teach students how to deal with them? And these are really interesting questions. So this framework, and you can find it as a PDF on our website and the links are at the end of my presentation. Um, has quite a useful section in it where it asks you, oh, it's almost an, a sort of audit, a self audit tool where it asks you as an individual, as an organisation, as a, as, a, as a curriculum, to what extent are you thinking about a number of these issues? So it's, it's a kind of helpful way to look at it there. So that, that was just drawing your attention to it. But the, the challenges that your, your little planes will have talked about, and I've ch chosen this image. I don't know if anyone speaks Spanish here. Um, I don't speak a word of Spanish, it's a language I've always struggled with. But this, this little symbol um, is, tra it, it's not a garage, but there's an expression of, called feeling like an octopus in a garage. Mm -hmm. And it means to feel completely out of place. And, and I think that kind of challenge that a lot of students feel, but also a lot of staff feel that sort of, I don't know this context, I don't understand what, what, what it's like and how can I, like we were saying this morning, how can I transport what I know into a totally alien environment is, is really tricky. But the first stage, I suppose, is being aware that it's a different environment. Um, is the first stage there. But the three main challenges that, that were brought out in this research were from a sort of a teaching point of view were the learning styles and a lot of these were myths or perceptions or misperceptions around learning styles, the cultural context and also what specific teaching needs arise from transnational environments. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of talk about these more specifically. Um, I'm not going to read this whole quote. Hopefully you can see even at the back. Is it clear enough? Um, learning style is an interesting one. We run quite a lot of workshops with staff and, and um, on internationalisation and on interculturalism. And um, staff members come to us and they say, well, I've got a lot of Chinese students in this class. How am I going to teach to Chinese students? And, and, and you sort of think, well, um, I don't, I don't know if we can talk about anyone as a homogenous group. I don't know if you could talk about how would you teach British students as a homogenous group. So in a sense, learning style, uh, and that's where I would go back to the, to the internationalising higher education curriculum framework is, is and, and what we were sort of talking about briefly this morning, is that sense of if your curriculum or your teaching style if you have a teaching style, if there's such a thing as a teaching style, is able to connect with a student as an individual in their own learning needs. And the, then, then is there such a thing as a cultural learning style? And I think some of the research that's come out, particularly around Chinese students, makes for some very interesting reading because it challenges these perceptions. Um, and this idea that they are not inflexible aspects of different cultures. I highlighted that because I think that's key. Can you see okay? I'm conscious I'm blocking your way. Um, are there any questions about that particular slide? So moving on to contextualization then. Now this is again an interesting point because it's the idea that um, 
as if contextualization is something that's a separate thing that you introduced in your teaching. So we're going to spend 10 minutes on contextualization and then we'll move on to the curriculum. And it, and, and it brings out that point as well, that is the curriculum a separate thing to your teaching? And I was at a workshop with Jude Carroll. I don't know if any of you have um, met Jude Carroll. She, she's brilliant and she has been talking and teaching about this kind of thing for many years and she's just um, published a book about tools and working in a sort of global world um, but this idea that she's saying that curriculum is the teaching and you can't separate the two um, and, I, and I think that's a really helpful way to think about the curriculum actually it's not just content it's about how you teach as well um, so so it, it does make the notion that you can you can take a Take, take a course and kind of impose it into, into another environment, it does make it seem slightly impossible, really, I would say. And then finally, staff needs. And again, a lot of staff speak to us about the, the kind of weight of expectation on them and the, um, they are, a lot of the time, and this is the same for sort of staff welcoming international students as well to the UK, a lot of it relies on the goodwill of staff. And a lot of pastoral support is needed. Um, and, it's, and it's kind of where's the support for staff there in institutions? So what has been done to, to give the proper staff development there? And I'd be really interested to hear your individual stories about that and how, how much support you feel is there or how much could be there. And I. I don't know if we could maybe talk about that at the end of this presentation. Um, and what sort of support would that take? What shape would that take? Um, but, but the idea is that it has to be an integrated part of their workload rather than being something that's just an expectation that's added on. And I know that it's, um, I mean, there's something very exciting about the opportunity to go and teach in another country and another culture. There is something that's really exciting and something that, that we can really learn from, I think, as individuals, but then, um, I was working in, in Singapore in the autumn and I was working in an institution where there was a large number of Western lecturers in, in this environment that was, that, was diff that was different for them and they had no training for and their frustrations about I don't know how to teach in this environment, I don't know what to do. Um, but, but their kind of excitement about it and their enthusiasm for it was, was brilliant but it's just this yeah, we're, what are we doing and how can we work more, um, I suppose like you were saying, Will, about the good practice, what, what, what case studies do we have um, of, of what's happening that can help us sort of draw on that. Um, so that, that was important. Um, I was at the Going Global conference, I don't know if any of you were there a couple of weeks ago, um, but again, transnational education was a huge focus uh, of the discussion. And I, I liked this quote, the idea that trying to describe quality is a bit like describing the colour yellow. But I suppose I was a bit intrigued as to why I chose the colour yellow, <laughs> because I wonder if any other colour would just have been as difficult to describe. Um, but, it, but it sort of... I suppose brings us into the idea of what, what is quality and we've been talking a lot about um, the systems and processes that, that are put in place to make sure and I know that I know that from sitting in staff meetings that a, a lot of members of staff have you, you want to be sure that if, if, if you're going there if you're, you're, you're giving a qualification that it's of the right level but then would it be this is it was like we were saying this morning is that the true in the UK? even can we say that it's true in the UK and I think that is important um, so definitions a little bit yellow maybe at this conference um, there was also uh, Joe Beale who's director of the British Council was talking about the need for a transnational education framework and I know that um, Speaking as someone whose mind doesn't work as a framework, uh, the thought of yet another framework to take on board is possibly uh, slightly exhausting. But at the same time, there's this recognition that if we are going to, we're all delivering TNE and it's happening across the globe, this is something we, sh we should work on collectively um, to try and solve. And um, a lot of concerns about that there is no way of not necessarily standardizing because again that's another word that a lot of academics don't like but but some kind of light touch benchmarking and um, was certainly being called for and asked for uh, at this conference in the report these are some quotes from the research the qualitative research that was carried out 
and students talked about why they would want to get a degree um, from a British university. So why, why, why do it? Um, one of the big aspects actually that this report drew out was the the way in which it helped, it, it was very good for widening access because it enabled students in other countries to attend virtually a British university in the way that they wouldn't have had the funds or been able to leave family or whatever. A lot of the reason that British students give for not travelling, um, so it sort of widens the access there. But I just, again, I'd quite like to dwell on this quote because this idea that um, the reputation of a UK university degree is an interesting one. That having a UK degree has prestige. I know that in certain parts of Europe that would not be the case. Um, that um, they're well respected and then sort of focusing a little bit on, I suppose, the employability aspect. There's been another uh, report that was just published in June. I don't know if many of you have come across it uh, by Elspeth Jones and um, Robin Mellersborn and Stephen Woodruff, looking specifically at the link between TNE and employability. And um, some really good, it's a really good report, actually. I've given you the link at the end to it as well. But they, they found that overall, um, students, TNE students, were much less aware of employability as a concept than, than British students um, at the same point. So that, that was kind of interesting. But higher education is something that Britain still makes, that the world still wants. Um, and I just wonder, again, how much you would agree with that, how much you think that's, and that's why I've put the misperceptions, but we can come back to that. These are some of the measures that some of the um, institutions interviewed put in place to try and combat some of the challenges we talked about earlier. So the, the challenges of, um, of, of learning styles, of contextualization, of staff needs. Um, and, and, and the report covers it much more in depth, but this idea that um, this idea that they're trying to work more collaboratively. So rather than just imposing a model, they're trying to say, well, the ones that we're imposing that aren't working, let's forget them. Let's focus on the ones that do work. Um, and this tighter enforcement of student feedback. And again, I wonder how much of these comments could apply to many universities in the UK. And I suppose um, an interesting and an important feature of this is, is a little bit like the point I touched on earlier, the fact that actually by having these intercultural encounters in an educational experience, there's a lot that can be we can take back from that. And actually a lot of the measures that were put in place to improve the teaching and learning experience for transnational students could also really help British students or students in the UK as well. So um, it's, it's a kind of, it could be a two-way process and it could work well from that point of view that could benefit all students, which brings us back to that idea that actually we are maybe becoming all international. There's some recommendations for, for good practice and I've printed, uh, put them on the slide as a whole because I thought they were important. I'm not going to read them all out, but that idea um, that collaboration seems to be key and, and like we were saying this morning, it's not something that you impose and, and just kind of let, let go of. Um, that we need to disseminate good practice, that there needs to be understanding about the different styles of learning. And the, and the multiple perspectives of transnational education, so it's not just something that the UK is, is doing and that's it, it's, it's, it's more, there's a plurality there that's important. Um, and the relationships and relationship building and, and, and to me as a sort of modern languages person that has to all come back to language and kind of understanding the, the, the sort of what it's like to be the guy, the octopus in the garage, or you know, the sort of that that mistranslation and the difficulties that that can happen there. Now, these are some of the tools. It didn't even occur to me that I would be able to click on them, and it would because I just assumed it it would never work. But um, these are, you, you, I, I think, the slides will be made available, won't they? So. Um, these are some of, of the tools that you, that you can go on and use. We've also got um, a huge number of resources that have been uh, the result of research that's been commissioned over, over a number of years on internationalising higher education, student life cycle, resource bank, and a lot of it 
applies to TNE and a lot of it is just very useful mini case studies, particularly from a disciplinary perspective that should, um, should help. So um, thank you very much for your time.